What were you afraid of most as a child? Spiders, maybe? Rats? How about demons? Those are the easy ones. Things like mortality, isolation, loneliness, though, they may be the scariest of all. Stop motion animation icon Henry Selick tackles the tough fears in some of your favorite childhood movies The Nightmare Before Christmas, Coraline, and now his new film, Wendell and Wild. These films deeply resonate with kids despite, or perhaps because of, their macabre trappings. I have been told I make horror films for kids, uh, and my thing I say is I make scary films for brave children of all ages. Where Selick excels is capturing the metaphysically terrifying wrapped within the visually unsettling, the truly horrifying childhood fear of powerlessness against the past, present, and future. From Coraline to Wendell and Wilde, let's dive into Henry Selick and the creepy coming-of-age story. Stop motion is a famously tedious medium. Frame by frame, puppets and props are meticulously maneuvered until they move with fluidity. Why does Selick prefer it? One of the main things about stop motion that I love is that it's, uh, it's very old-fashioned. It was the first type of animation that was created more than 100 years ago. Um, and so I'm looking to tell stories that have a bit of a timeless quality. In true storybook fashion, the start of James and the Giant Peach seems to take place everywhere and nowhere at once. Bookended by narration, there's a whimsy to the whole thing that makes it feel like a parable of sorts. Selick divides a dour, live-action real world with the lively stop-motion insides of the enchanted fruit. Young orphan James lives with two cruel aunts, whose opulent costuming and exaggerated behavior highlight James's disconnection from the world after the death of his parents. I've already wasted four minutes of daylight. Look at him, lollygagging in dreamland, when there's so much work to do. Weeds to pull, wood to chop. Work, 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 work! When the peach appears, there's an immediate visual contrast before we even set sight on any stop motion. It's a veritable wrecking ball against the backdrop of a dreary environment, bathing James in a warm glow that signals changes to come. When we dive into the world within the peach, however, we initially seem meant to be afraid. Giant bugs are revealed in silhouette against eerie green lighting, their mouths and eyes a gaping prominent white. Please, don't eat me! James himself is terrified until the bugs burst into lively song. They're quaint, kind, almost parental. The group's whirlwind adventures as they journey across the ocean see James embracing the bugs as his own found family until this stop-motion world begins to feel like its truest version. The moment we're thrust onto the streets of a very real New York City the switch is jarring as James and the Peach become a spectacle. When his aunts arrive in a crushed car, they emerge like a pair of sea creatures from a mangled vehicle. Mascara runs down their faces as they ooze around in drenched clothes. The bugs, in contrast, arrive in a halo of light to save the day. It's a visual representation of their true natures, a reminder of the warmth of the family James has chosen for himself over the unsettling reality of the ugliness he left behind. Rats and cats and button eyes. Coraline reads like a twisted mirror to James's fairy tale escape. Parallel worlds are mainstays of Selick's work, whether safe or sinister. Seeing the Wizard of Oz for the first time when I'm a kid, the idea of journeying to a, a magical place, returning to your home, not necessarily knowing how real, that was certainly a film that inspired me a lot. In Coraline in particular, this idea of two versions of your own life, and one seems so much better. Everything there is like customized for yourself. Uh, there's just a very small price you have to pay. And the price in Coraline nearly seems worth it. When we're introduced to Coraline and her family, they've just moved into a creaky old house in a dreary new neighborhood. An accident is hinted at but never explicitly described. We only know that Coraline's mother was injured badly enough to require a neck brace. That resentment has grown between the two because of it. But then we had the accident. It wasn't my fault you hit that truck. I never said it was. Like James, Coraline's day-to-day -day life is marked by colorlessness. Gray skies, gray house, gray parents who dismiss their daughter's curiosity. Stomping around in a striking yellow coat, she's the sole shock of color. 
In one particular scene, Coraline fixates on a bright pair of striped gloves that her mother firmly rejects. In the moment, it feels like a rejection of Coraline herself, a lack of validation to Coraline's interests and curiosity. Put them back. But mom, the whole school's gonna wear boring gray clothes. No one will have these. Put them back. Enter the other mother, a witch also known as the Belle Dame. Offering a perfectly tailored playground, she lures Coraline via the material and emotional. The sense that she knows Coraline more than anyone else in the world seems to. The promise of adoration and attention. The promise of escape. Hop on, kiddo. I want to show you something. I can't believe you did this. Mother said you'd like it, or she knows you like the back of her hand. But when Coraline rejects the horrifying offer of sewing buttons into her eyes, we watch as the Bell Dam's lair morphs from wondrous paradise into oversaturated horror. There's an unfortunate uselessness to the adults in this story. Coraline's neighbors warn her of danger, but immediately dismiss these warnings as fanciful nothings. Coraline's parents escape from the Bell Dam's clutches, but remember nothing. Interestingly, the only other characters to engage directly with the Bell Dam are a black cat and Wybie, another child. It's indicative of the fears of childhood, too often not taken seriously by the adults in our lives, but shared by kids learning the world just as we are. What Coraline demonstrates is the temptation of escapism in the face of change, the overarching struggle of readapting to a new stage of life and retreating into an idealized version of reality without facing it head on. And ultimately, the danger posed by those so ruthlessly intent on controlling you, they'll consume everything you are in service of themselves. Why does she want me? She wants something to love, I think. Something that isn't her. Or maybe, she just loves something to eat. What's this? Just a little holiday stealing between friends. The Nightmare Before Christmas serves as one of Selleck's rare features that does not star a young protagonist. However, Jack arguably experiences a delayed adolescence of sorts. Jack Skellington may be technically an adult, but he's really childish. Him and his followers live in a land of make-believe, and uh, he's not a, a very mature adult. The difference between Jack and other Selleck protagonists may seem fairly obvious. Rather than an outsider, Jack is a leader beloved within his community, receiving accolades left and right as he and the townsfolk wreak havoc each Halloween. So what exactly is the problem? Well, the core conflict circles a crisis of identity related to what he wants out of life. Who is he beyond that which he can provide others? Why exactly has he lost his passion for something he's so clearly great at? The citizens of Halloween Town place expectations upon him as a leader Jack doesn't feel suited for, driving home his conviction that none of them truly understand him. In Jack's Lament, he describes a longing for something to break through his daily monotony. Upon discovering Christmas, he dives in with childlike wonder without stopping to consider any of the consequences. What we know is Jack doesn't quite fit in here either. While Halloween Town relies on a spooky palette of desaturated oranges, blues, and greens, Christmas Town sparkles in bright reds and primary colored string lights. The problem is not his appreciation, rather his overwhelming desire to take, the impossible need to physically possess a feeling, a sense of awe evoked by something new. What follows, of course, is pure disaster. Santa Claus kidnapped, monstrous toys, carnivorous wreaths, it's Halloween cosplaying as Christmas in all the worst possible ways. It all culminates with Jack crash landing into a cemetery, dramatically bemoaning his failure in the song Poor Jack. But what he rediscovers is a passion for performance. Reading like a resurrection of sorts, Jack quite literally rises from the grave born anew. In a way, The Nightmare Before Christmas is all about reconnection with oneself, with one's community. Like Coraline, Jack's journey brings him back to the place that didn't feel like enough. This time, however, he's able to open his eyes to what he loves about it. And the citizens of Halloween Town are there waiting for him with open arms.
While Jack's danger derives from his own recklessness, Wendell and Wilde shows us just how perilous the outside world can be. Mischievous demons might be resurrecting the dead, but the true threat to our characters derives from the greed of capitalism. I wanted there to be some anchor points in real life and in the real world to kind of counterbalance the fantasy, comedy, horror of, of everything else, you know, so that the film doesn't just float away in the make-believe. And the emotional through line for Cat, again, I wanted it to be based on something real. It felt important to me to, like, bite off something a little more serious. The story follows Kat, a young orphan transferring from a juvenile detention facility to a boarding school nestled in her dilapidated childhood hometown. Kat has been unable to move beyond her past, feeling responsible for her parents' death in a car accident years ago. She dons a cold persona, self-isolating in response to bullying and victimization at the hands of the U.S. carceral system. Kat's piercings and bright green hair set her apart, but the subtleties of her well-meaning classmates' behavior drive the wedge. Siobhan, daughter of the wealthy and conniving Clax family, serves as the crux of this. Her insistence on the nickname KK may appear innocuous, but it's a covert rejection of Kat's identity, an attempt to shape her into something palatable to these pampered private school girls. The same occurs with Raoul, a young trans boy Siobhan continues deadnaming while falling back on the phrase, I keep forgetting, in order to absolve herself. It hints at a pattern in which Siobhan bulldozes forward with little regard for the feelings of her supposed friends. The result is pain, regardless of malicious intent. At every turn, Kat rejects mentorship and guidance. The demons Wendell and Wilde find it easy to manipulate her, a so-called hell maiden, promising to resurrect her parents should she swear allegiance and summon them to the surface. Her parents represent a source of forgiveness and comfort. When they're reunited, height markers on the walls see her walk metaphorically backward through time right into their arms. Is that you, Kat? You've grown so much. Mom, Dad. <gasps> mm. it, it's okay. I got you back. Oh. Time and memory loom over Kat the way she's lived, the way she's been treated, it all leads back to her parents over and over and over. A powerful climax sees her battle the manifestation of loneliness, rage, and fear birthed from this guilt that has ruled her life. Own your memories! She prevails through strength of will and, finally, providing herself the kindness so many people have refused her. Kat has been forced to grow up too quickly as the adults in her life have too often failed her. Her relationship with sister Helly, revealed to be another Hell Maiden, proves deeply healing. The two quite literally become blood bonded as a means of rescuing Kat from becoming consumed by her demons. Interestingly, a parental relationship drives Wendell and Wilde's motives as well. Their entire plot to build an afterlife carnival drives them to scheme under their controlling father's nose, who atones later after revealing his fear of driving away and losing Wendell and Wilde, just as he lost his other children. The parental relationship is always a complicated one in Selig's work. Absence prevails, through death, as in the case of James and Wendell and Wilde, or through the cold distance we see in Coraline. Yet the common thread is that these children desperately want their parents while in times of great distress. Perhaps the most frightening thing is calling for the comfort and safety of a parent while watching that call go unanswered. Really need to talk to you. Good night, Mom. Good night, Dad. At the end of the day, our villains aren't the demons Wendell and Wilde. Rather, true evil comes from the Clax family. They seek to build a private prison with plans to channel troubled youth in the hopes of profiting off of systemic injustice. Cat embraces the chance to bulldoze this toxicity and revive the town and community she said goodbye to years ago. It's animation, and I think we have a better chance of connecting with a, our audience with kids as protagonists. I'd rather go on their journey than a lot of other characters' journeys. Earlier, we heard Selleck describe himself as making scary films for brave children. And being an outsider is scary, but it's relatable too. We've all felt alone. And watching Selleck's work, as eerie as it can be, feels almost like a homecoming. 
It's an ode to the outsider in us all. I feel like I'm trapped inside this old man's body. I'm probably like a 12 or 13 year old uh, child. So it's not that f hard for me to get inside the heads of these young characters and, and connect and remember what I went through as an outsider as a kid. These creepy coming of age stories may embrace fantasy and make believe, but at their core beat resounding real world problems. Diving into strange new worlds to discover our own power. Finding and forming your own family. Fighting for yourself when no one else seems to. Growing up is tough, but whimsy makes it all a little easier.